I thought it would be fun to have uh, four uh, speakers who would speak to us about different aspects about both managerial and technological issues um, and uh, hoping that it uh, inspires uh, some of uh, uh, some of uh, us, me, but also some of you to take to, 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 to pay more attention to this when we are doing our uh, research. Uh, so it's going to be a bit disjointed because it's going to be different topics, but I think you know, there's lots to learn here. So the first speaker is uh, Yves Alexandre de Montjoie, who's, uh, who teaches at uh, Imperial College he's an, and he's one of the world's uh, best uh, specialists on uh, privacy. And he will explain to us why technology means that uh, uh, privacy is not just a yes or no thing, but there are difficulties with it. And you'll notice that he's got the most beautiful beard of uh, anybody in this uh, conference. Uh, Yves Alexandre, up to you. you unmute yourself, please. Oops, sorry. Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Jacques, and for the invitation to speak. Uh, so I think we have 15 minutes. Uh, basically, what I'm going to try to do is, in good start, in good. Engineering style, you know, topics to discuss and, and where the state of the art is uh, when it comes to uh, privacy engineering uh, research. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to talk about, you know, what we call basically the, the technical search for uh, anonymous data and really how the field has been moving from the identification to, you know, the identification mechanism to privacy preserving and anonymous uh, systems. Um, and just to be clear, like this is what I focus on. Um, this is the type of data that we work with, uh, you know, large scale behavioral data uh, collected basically as a side effect of our use of technology. I think like, you know, the previous session mentioned like, you know, Facebook uh, data, you know, mobile phone data, uh, credit card and other kind of uh, data sets. And these data sets are, are absolutely amazing. I mean, they're really, in my opinion, driving a lot of the uh, advances that we've seen in uh, deep learning and AI recently. It's like, you know, it's a game changer when it comes to, to clearly social science research, but also increasingly in, uh, in economics. Um, however, when, when you start digging into these, these data sets and, and looking at these data sets and analyzing them, uh, you know, there's always a time in which you, you feel, you know, there's something weird, right? Like this is this is literally someone's life. Like, you know, these are like, you know, hundreds to thousands of data points per person per day on how someone has been has been behaving. Uh, and, and there's always very quickly the, the, the privacy question that comes. Um, and what's really interesting uh, to me is very often uh, when you start digging and start asking questions, uh, you often get the same answer. And so this is one example of a time where this answer was provided to, to really reassure you that, you know, there was, there was no risk and, and nothing to discuss. Uh, this was uh, TFL, so Transport from London, uh, the subway system in London, basically collecting Wi-Fi data of every single person using the subway system, but also passing by any Wi-Fi uh, access point. And when you started asking questions, you got the answer that, you know, really you should not worry that this information is, is anonymous. Uh, and if you're not sure what anonymous means, they make it overly clear that it was depersonalized, whatever that means, so that no one can be uh, identified. Uh, and actually, the, this, this, this idea of, of anonymity, this idea of, of breaking basically the link between a person and his or her uh, data before giving it to the analyst uh, is, is deeply rooted in our uh, data privacy uh, laws. If you look at GDPR, if you look at CCPAs, both of them basically roughly do not apply anymore as soon as the data is anonymous. So, so far, everything's good. Uh, and even when you start uh, looking, technically, we have actually quite a big uh, uh, literature in how do we anonymize data. Someone answering one of our paper told us that, you know, we, there's 40 years of, of literature in how we, we take data and we safely anonymize it uh, before, before using it. Basically, pseudonymization, de-identification 
you remove direct identifiers, pseudonymization, and then you start adding noise, we call it swapping, suppress to try to prevent re-identification. Uh, however, I think what a lot of research in the past 10 years has showed is that this might not be as secure and as robust as uh, we, might, uh, we might believe uh, when reading the news. Uh, and basically, I'll try to make an argument in, in three acts on why uh, traditional de-identification techniques, basically the way we've been doing things in the past, is not appropriate anymore, given the technical state of the art. Uh, first, learning from, from Jacques, it's basically pseudonymization, it's, it's really this one, it's, it's rarely enough, right? It's like just removing direct identifiers is often very rarely sufficient to properly anonymize data and prevent re-identification. Uh, as a little game, uh, let's imagine that we have a data set of, of mobility data. Uh, you know someone, you're searching for someone in the, for someone in this data set. In this case, uh, in this case, Jacques, you know where Jacques uh, was at a given place at a given time. And basically the question is, how much does it take? How hard is it if I have a location data, I'm searching for Jacques, I know Jacques is in the data set. What does it take for me to find him? And basically what our research and a lot of others have shown is basically it's quite easy. Uh, specifically for mobile phone data, what we showed is that most of the time, actually 95% of the time, knowing four places and times where someone was is sufficient to uniquely identify him 95% of the time. That basically means that, that yes, there's a lot of people around Jack right now at TSE, uh, you know, but very few of them will then go back you know, somewhere close to his home uh, tonight, uh, and then potentially back at TSC tomorrow morning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very quickly, few pieces of auxiliary information are sufficient to uniquely identify uh, someone. So pseudonymization rarely enough. Second act: noise addition. Right. Very often you say, well, yes, but this is because you have precise information. Maybe if I were to add noise. Uh, I could actually hide Jacques' data within the data set and prevent re-identification. Uh, the idea is, is quite simple. It's very similar to like, you know, face recognition or images. Basically, I'm going to blur it, right? I would make the information less precise. Can I, and the question is, can I blur it enough to prevent re-identification? And basically what we showed in, in another piece of research is that uh, very quickly, this is not sufficient either. Basically, you have... Um, decreasing returns with noise addition. And as you keep adding more and more noise, the return that you get for adding this noise uh, decreases. So not only you are losing utility, you are losing some of the quality of the data, but every time you need to add more and more noise to be able to prevent re-identification, to decrease the risk of re-identification. So noise addition is not sufficient either. Third one, uh, uncertainty. Uh, it's, it's a big, fairly popular uh, technique at the moment that basically goes along the lines of, well, because I don't have the entire data set or because I'm only giving you a fraction of the data set, even if you were to find Jack in this data set, uh, maybe it's not him. And actually, you know, if I sample 1% of the data set and you find Jack in a sample of 1%, actually, you know, 99% of the time, you're going to be wrong. And, and basically what we did lately, I think in a paper published, uh, published last week, is, uh, last week, last year, uh, is basically to show that, that this, is, this, is, this is true, yes, but at the same time, we, we, like, you know, we can do a lot better, right? We have this, this, this kind of cool field called statistics that's actually quite good at quantifying uncertainty um, in whether we, we identify the right person. And basically what we did in this paper uh, published in Nature Communication is basically to, to estimate the likelihood of me to have identified Jack in the data set. What does it take? And maybe if I have you know, a few pieces of information, this might not be sufficient. If I find a person who uh, is an economist, teaches at TSC, lives in a certain place, drives a certain type of car, the color of the car, has a dog, et cetera, et cetera, very quickly the likelihood of another person in the part of the data set I do not have access to, to contain this person is quite low. And therefore I'm very likely to have correctly we identified Jack. And actually what we showed is that in the US, uh, 15 demographic attributes are sufficient to uniquely identify someone, to re-identify someone 
in a, a US person in a data set 99.98% of the time. So in any data set where you are searching for the person with these 15 demographic attributes, you're gonna find the person 99.98% of uh, the time. So basically the conclusion of these, these, these three quick pieces is that we really do believe that yes, it's, it's enticing and it's, it's, it's a useful uh, notion, but really technically how we use to achieve anonymization, how we use to, to break this link between a person uh, and and this this is data basically just just does not work anymore, right? Like the data we have today is is too large, too rich. Uh, we have too many pieces of auxiliary information that we can use to re-identify someone to be able to reasonably uh, anonymize uh, the type of data sets that we are dealing with uh, today. Uh, this is a perspective that was shared, for example, by PCAST. That went even further and said that you know it's basically they don't see these kind of the identification technique as a useful basis for policy. Um, despite all of this research, we, we just keep seeing it happening. Uh, these are, for example, two examples from from Australia, in which basically they released uh, government survey data, medical data, uh, de-identify thirty years of data in two thousand sixteen. Uh, only to, to take it back a week or two later when researchers contacted them to tell them that it was actually quite easy to re-identify people in this data that they made publicly available. Um, it sort of it happened uh, two years ago, actually, when we saw the headlines that actually we know whether Trump is, is a good businessman or not. And actually, when you dig into the uh, New York Times uh, piece, you can see that actually this information comes from publicly available data that has always been available uh, with basically uh, some level of anonymization that was not sufficient to prevent uh, the reporter from the New York Times to actually find Trump in these uh, data sets. So these are not just, you know, theoretical attack that academics are building. These are happening in uh, practice and are real risk. Moving forward, I think increasingly what, what we see and where the state of the art is moving is really towards, you know, security mechanism. Can we try to find a way to to give access to the data while maintaining some level of control. Basically, from an information theoretic standpoint, uh, we don't really believe that you can keep anonymizing the data and then, and, then, and then just give it away. You need to maintain some kind of control to be able to control how much information you're releasing and ensure that you protect uh, anonymity. A big part of this is query-based system. It's basically you remotely access the data set, for example, through an SQL interface or any other kind of interfaces that would only return uh, aggregated data to you. Uh, aggregated data can be a count, can be a machine learning model, can be the result of a statistical analysis. Uh, quick note of caution, however, uh, simply, remove, simply returning aggregate is not necessarily sufficient. Uh, this is just a very simple example that I want to leave you guys with. Uh, like, you know, obviously if I'm only returning aggregate, uh, my system would refuse to answer this question. Right? Like, let's assume there's only one Bob in my data set. Obviously, the data, the uh, system will say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not answering this question, right? Obviously, this, this touches upon one person, and so this is not aggregated, therefore, I do not answer. However, just consider this, this simple other way to get at the same information. I'm going to ask the same thing about everyone. So a lot of people, I'm going to ask the same thing about everyone but the person of interest very quickly, I will get the answer to uh, my question and bypass the aggregation. Um, there's a range of attacks basically that are being developed against these kind of systems, as well as defense uh, mechanisms. Um, so really, these systems are good, aggregated is good, but aggregating is not a silver bullet, uh, and it's not, it's not sufficient. This is an example of a state-of-the-art system from uh, Max Planck uh, Institute that we attacked with my team uh, two years ago which basically we showed that uh, once you uh, find a vulnerability, so we build upon a theoretical vulnerability from the 2000s to build this attack. And you can see that basically as soon as you have the attack, you can basically do uh, close to as well as if you were to have direct access uh, to the data set. Uh, finally, I think the last thing that I want to leave you with is, is really to think about privacy, not only about the individual, but also the network effect that can be at play in uh, privacy as soon as data basically relates to more than one person or you have access to uh, data about people you're connected to, 
and we started basically formalizing uh, models for load and edge observability, and then start studying the network effect that can be at play. We were talking about Cambridge Analytica at the end of the previous session. So we're basically building model to try to estimate the network effect at play, for example, in the case of Cambridge Analytica or other uh, surveillance uh, mechanisms. Uh, so basically, I think to uh, conclude, one, data anonymization, the traditional, like, let me take the data, anonymize it once and for all, and, and publicly publish it, uh, doesn't really work anymore. And as PK said, does not really have a policy relevance uh, anymore. There is a road modern privacy engineering techniques that, that exist and that will allow you to, to fully use the data while preserving privacy, uh, but they really need to be developed for every uh, use case. And then finally, always remember that you know we, we have the theory we have the the actual implementations none of them are silver bullet and there's really a need to constantly keep testing the robustness of the techniques that are being uh, deployed and really make sure that that these techniques with reasonable assumption really reach the uh, intent of uh, the law thank you thank you very much Yves Alexandre. this was great uh, i have one question from uh, alexandre de cornier uh, how costly is it to re-identify people? I mean, is it something which is, because if it's very costly, it's not really relevant. I mean, uh, do you have any idea of? Uh... That's a great, that's a great question. And, and this is actually something that, again, it's, it's very, in a lot of our conversations, right? It's, it's really, we hear that fairly often. It's fairly often, it's like, oh, well, it's complex. It's like, you know, you need a PhD in statistics to re-identify people. Uh, honestly, it's, it's, it's not, right? Like the vast majority of these techniques are, are actually fairly simple, uh, like, you know, publicly available. Uh, honestly, like to me, the, the standard is I, you know, I teach a privacy engineering course, uh, basically at the end of eight hours of, of training, we give them data sets and they, they manage to re-identify people with, with no issues. Uh, so it's, it's really, it is not, it is not, like, you know, we're not talking about, you know, trying to crack like, you know, we're not talking about like you know hundreds of, of GPUs to try to crack some some password or or pseudonymization mechanism. Like this is literally you know statistical matching, potentially profiling technique. Most of them are available. Uh, so like yeah, no no more yeah, no more. Okay, thank you very much. And we are not hearing you, so it's a good. I don't even. Then, you're cutting off, so I'm uh, <laughs> on your own, so I don't even need to cut you off. But thank you very much, Yves Alexandre. This was uh, fantastic. Uh, the, uh, Jacques, did you mute yourself? No, somebody muted me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the... As you, I mean, economists are very excited about interoperability. Uh, if there's going to be interoperability between platforms and, you know, uh, other usage of a platform, it's going to be through something which is called uh, APIs. And I thought it would be nice to have a little exploration of the uh, benefits and limits of APIs. Uh, in order to do this, I'm cheating because the next speaker is not an engineer. Uh, worse off, even is a lawyer, uh, but uh, he's been uh, working quite a bit on APIs and trying to convince the legal community to take them uh, seriously. So it's uh, Chris Riley who worked for a long time for uh, Mozilla and now uh, works for uh, a think tank called the R Street uh, Institute in uh, Washington. Chris, you've got 15 minutes. Thank you, Jacques. I, I usually say that I'm a public policy professional I went to law school. I used to be a lawyer, but now I'm getting better. Um, but I do also have a doctorate in computer science. So I'm at that rare, weird intersection of technology and law. You gave a lot of my setup already. Um, the importance of APIs, the importance of interoperability. I think uh, Is Alessandro is talking about challenging one long held assumption within the regulatory community around privacy and the relative protections of anonymous data. I think APIs and the emergence of the importance of interoperability are beginning to challenge a fundamental, maybe not an assumption, but a paradigm for how antitrust and competition theory approaches single firm conduct. And I think we're starting to see that play out. Uh, I, I have had the pleasure of talking about API for a few years now. And one of the, the most uh, in, in, impactful and, and also fun 
meetings I've ever had with government was in 2018. I had a, a 14 or 15 on one meeting me with uh, 15 members of the leadership of the Federal Trade Commission for an hour and a half to explain to them the importance of APIs and interoperability in the functioning of the modern internet. I'm going to try to compress some of that into 15 minutes, but please forgive me if I'm abstracting up a fair bit. So I'm gonna use this first slide to illustrate what um, one of the forms of documentation of an API looks like. This is Slack, the, the Slack messenger service, increasingly popular throughout the pandemic, of course. I'm a big fan. I'm also a big fan of how they document their APIs. So an API is, is it, it involves software, but it's better not to think about it as a piece of software. I think of it as something like an instruction manual for a service. It tells you what you can do and what effect that action will have. So the Slack APIs are designed to help software developers build apps that interoperate with Slack. An API uh, allows you to build a messaging app that can communicate with Slack users, at least in theory, or something completely different, something totally downstream that allows you to build on Slack as a platform. Platforms like Slack operate APIs in order to allow other technologies to work with them. Now this whole platform economy concept, there's a lot of different people who use this term in different ways. I think it's fair to use the term platform both to refer to hosting content you, uh, as, a, as an internet service that allows users to contribute content like a YouTube or a Facebook, as well as hosting other businesses in fact. And in fact, when we think of modern day digital platforms, they are fulfilling both of those functions. So just as a contextual note, but in the context of APIs, really what we're focused on here are how does a platform make available access to its services, to its content, to its network, and to its users, to other technologies and other businesses in order to do more impressive things together? So what types of APIs are there? Now, I don't think there's a single set in stone difference for these categories. So I will be upfront that these are the terms I use to distinguish these, open, private, and public. I think it's useful to think of there as three different kinds of categories. To me, open API means no restrictions, no limitations. You make available this interface and you don't track who's using it. You don't limit use to it. It is truly open. Obviously with that kind of an API, you can't offer any form of sensitive or personal or protected data because there are no limits and no restrictions on it. It's kind of an edge case. I'm not gonna talk about open APIs anymore. I just want to define that when I use the term open, I mean that many people use open API to mean what I call public API, an API that is made available to a third party to use as distinct from a private API. However, I resist using open when it is something so limited because the, the framing connotations are very challenging. Public APIs in fact do include many restrictions, which I'll get into more in a little bit, but um, they, that's really the heart of, of when we think about APIs in the relation to interoperability and to antitrust and competition, we are focused primarily on public APIs. However, it's important to understand public APIs stand in contrast to private APIs, which are set up primarily, actually exclusively, for use by other services offered by the same company. So for example, I can promise you, although I don't know, not having worked there, Facebook and WhatsApp have private APIs that allow those two services to exchange functionality and information with each other that are not made available in any way, shape or form to other social networks or other messaging services. Technically, just as a detail, private APIs may not be an entire API. There may be a public API, such as the ones I showed with Slack, which we'll come back to in a little bit, by the way. There may be a public API that says, hey, we wanna be interoperable. Here's how you can send messages into our messaging service. Here's how you can look to see if there's a user on a service. Here are all our great public APIs and public methods, which is another name for the function, the, the call that comes into the system. And then as a part of that public API, there may be private methods, private pieces of the public API structure that are another way that platforms can better control and manage access into their services and into their infrastructure. But put a pin in those restrictions on public APIs because I will get into those a little later. So why do we do APIs? APIs are, uh, well, was abstraction as a, as a starting point principle is necessary for software development. I learned to program in the 1990s. I learned to program in the C programming language, which nobody uses anymore because it's, it's horribly unsafe. 
Um, but it's very powerful. And the thing that I loved about programming in the 90s was I could think about the entire program. I had every line of code in my head. I knew what every single piece did. Um, with some exceptions, there still were some libraries that I didn't know. So even in the 90s, we needed abstraction in order to build complex software. One of the first things you learn to do when you program is print. But print a line on the screen. And in C, there's a function called printf that just takes arguments and puts hello world on the screen. I have no idea how printf works. As powerful as my knowledge of C and the relationship to the computer was, I have no idea how printf works. That same principle of abstraction has just been taken up to another level and put onto the internet. And that's what APIs are. That's why they're ubiquitous. That's why they are such a central part of how internet services operate. They help specialize. They help make sure that when you have two teams, large teams at a place like Facebook, you have the user interface team that, that builds how users send content to and read content from the system. And you have the trust and safety team that looks at that content to see whether it's terrorist content to make sure that Facebook is in compliance with laws and enforcing its own policies. The user experience team doesn't need to know how the trust and safety code works and vice versa. They set up internal methods of communication with each other, generally via APIs, private ones in this case, in order to reach that level of functional specialization. Another thing that you'll see as you read more about APIs, there are a lot of companies that want to sell an API. API is a very valuable commercial resource. What they're selling is not the API in itself, but rather access to the resource that is protected by the API. So they will have an API that allows for a certain amount of access. If you want more and more access to that resource through that same API, you pay more money. It's as simple as that. Now, what kinds of restrictions are put onto these APIs? The first and foremost one to keep in mind is authentication. You have to ensure that the user, the program, the service that is accessing that API has the right to do so, the permission to do so. It's necessary for any form of protected data to be made available. It's also necessary for security, even if you're not offering protected data, but you wanna make sure that you're not supporting bot operations or interference from a repressive foreign government or known spammers or that sort of thing. You generally have to put an authentication layer on any public facing API that you offer. And particularly if it's commercial, if you're trying to make money off of the access to it, you have to have an authentication layer. But even for free service, for these spam, bot, abuse controls, you need authentication layers. That then sets up the other three categories of APIs, oh, sorry, of API restrictions. Pricing and access control, so that you can charge for API access, which sets up very effective freemium style models, which I, I would argue Twitter offers something like that, but, but they may frame it differently. So Twitter has fairly good APIs to allow you to send messages to and receive messages from their services, but they have pretty aggressive limits on that as a way of making sure that you can get to a little bit of access, but not a lot. Now, this is where some of the complexities in the competition theory start to come in, in this pricing and access control layer. Those rates aren't subject to any form of legal regulation anywhere in the world. And there are no clear laws against varying pr prices by who's purchasing it. So in the US in particular, there's no limit on self-preferencing or refusing to provide access to a competitor. Obviously EU law is different. Um, we're gonna see this being tested as the Federal Trade Commission's lawsuit against Facebook continues. The massive wave of antitrust lawsuits that we've seen over the past few months, they're primarily about mergers, but there is a huge section in the FTC's lawsuit, which is really just about interoperability and about how Facebook has managed access to its APIs. Rate limiting and throttling, I mentioned a little bit. It's a very common technique that allows for some amount of free access to a service, but beyond a certain point, you throttle it back, you slow it down, or you just cut them off so that they can only access it periodically. If, of course, you pay more, you usually can get more. Privacy and security controls on APIs are their own very, very large category. But I think this is an important one because APIs come into two different categories. There are general APIs, and then there are user-driven APIs. So Twitter used to offer a general API to its entire timeline to everyone posting every message on Twitter. I think they still share some version of that with the Library of Congress, actually. If you can set, anyway, there's lots of privacy complexities here, but, but let me stick to the categorization. That is a general API that does not limit the amount of data to that accessible by a specific user. A user-driven API, by contrast, is the sort of thing that Facebook would offer. So imagine a future where you don't have to use the Facebook app to get to Facebook, 
you can use something else. You could use Slack, maybe. Still though, Facebook doesn't want to make available its entire user base, that would be disastrous. But Facebook could be expected to make available to you as a Facebook user through an API, the content that you can access on Facebook. So that sort of user-driven and user-controlled concept of an API is fundamental to this future vision of interoperability. So you as a user would say, hey, Facebook, I want Slack to be able to read my Facebook messages. And Facebook would check, yep, Slack is okay. They're not spam, they're not a bot. Yep, you are you, you have authenticated. Okay, I will let Slack access your and only your messages within Facebook. Limiting APIs to that kind of user-driven concept makes it a lot easier for the platform to limit the data the API can reach to only data that the user themselves could access if they were directly using the platform. So how do these privacy and security controls actually play out in law and in regulation? We don't know the answer to that yet. The text on this slide is how the 2019 Access Act from US Senators Blumenthal, Warner, and Hawley address that. It's just some language that says, yes, you need to have privacy and security standards. One of the most hard questions in how this plays out, this tension between privacy, security, and openness via interoperability will be in how this works out. APIs evolve over time, like all computer code. This is normal, but it has consequences. We've talked a lot about Cambridge Analytica, but Cambridge Analytica is, is a very good historical example of an API that needed to evolve in order to limit the kinds of data that was available. Reliance issues come up though. If you, like Facebook, uh, offer APIs and then businesses build downstream of you in reliance on those APIs, and then you change those APIs. And maybe as happened in 2018, that change breaks a fundamental function that that business needed and they are unable to adapt or compensate for that change. Suddenly there are competition challenges and maybe Facebook has a right to do that. Maybe they were doing it for an anti-competitive purpose. These are the kinds of interesting questions that we don't know. And they're all sort of illustrated by this API dynamic that has occurred. I personally consider this all a kind of a deep theoretical challenge to Clayton Christensen's theory of disruptive innovation. If a disruptive mer market emerges downstream of a platform that is dependent on that platform's APIs, they have control over that and they can nip that potential disruption in the bud and really have some pretty significant effects on economic theory, I think. I'll uh, move quickly to a close here as I'm running low on time, I know, but the, from, a, from a, a regulatory legal governance paradigm perspective, sorry to venture back into lawyer territory here, we don't really know what interoperability via APIs looks like. It's not quite the same thing as a traditional supply chain model. It's not quite the same thing as banking, though the open banking uh, movement in the UK and the law there has started to do some pretty interesting things around interoperability. And it's not quite the same thing as traditional communications markets where there are established principles of, of uh, non-discrimination and fairness baked into the law. It shares some elements of these paradigms, but it's all a little bit different. So the computer scientist in me approaches this a lot more simply. The internet secret sauce is its openness and that openness is made real via APIs. So it's why I'm such a strong advocate for APIs and for interoperability in this context, because I, I regard it as truly central to the, the economic and social benefits that we've gotten from the internet. So I have one final brief theory, and this is not something I've tested, but it's something that has been operating a lot of my thinking for a while as well. When a platform is small, it benefits more by being heavily interconnected to established services, and it shows its value to them and grows by offering value to users of those services through fairly open APIs. Once it reaches a certain scale, suddenly others start to benefit more from its relatively open APIs than it gets in return. Therefore, its natural incentives start to flip and it starts to close these down and try to silo more and more usage and value within itself. This is what I hope to continue to poke at and test in the years to come. Thank you very much, Chris. That was uh, really interesting. And I'm sure that uh, a number of people in the audience will get back to you to discuss some of the issues in more Absolutely. detail. I'm sure, I'm sure I will in any case. Uh, so our third speaker is uh, Boris uh, Otto, who works, I'm sorry, my uh, German pronunciation is even worse than my English pronunciation, <laughs> uh, works for the Fraunhofer ISST. Uh, uh, Boris is, uh, has been uh, very influential in uh, data space, in uh, data spaces, which are the means by which you 
exchange data space. And in particular, this is very important for the uh, Gaia X uh, project of which uh, CEO uh, Hubert Tardieu uh, has uh, very kindly joined us. Uh, the, so basically, the, what are the limits? Uh, do we what limits do we have about exchanging data, trading data? And that's a question which is very important for economics, but clearly has got some uh, engineering uh, aspects. So Boris, you've got uh, 15 minutes. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction, Jacques. Um, let me first share my screen. Uh, it should work now, and you should now be able to. Now you can see the slides, I suppose, right? Yeah. So what I, as you said, Jacques, what I want to talk a little bit about is uh, the fundamentals of data spaces, how that actually works. And then particular also talk a little bit about what implications that um, that has for an economic perspective uh, on the topic. So um, as Jacques, as you mentioned, um, obviously data space is, um, is somehow a, a hot topic these days. If we look into the digital transformation, not only of businesses, but also of, of let's say states or even economic regions. Um, I brought here with me a quote from Ursula von der Leyen from her State of the Union address um, of last September. Uh, where she basically called for the establishment of uh, common uh, data spaces. And in fact, they uh, want to create nine data spaces. So the topic has received quite attention and um, uh, is discussed quite vividly. But then of course, questions arise, okay, well, sounds nice, uh, data space to share data, but what actually is a data space, right? And that is something that I would like to touch upon on, on the next slide. Um, in general, a data space is a data integration concept, which has for the first time been proposed some 15 years ago. Um, and I would like to outline the general uh, design principles um, for, for a moment. Um, a data space does not require physical data integration, but it rather leaves data where it is, which is very important because it means that you do not are forced to dump your data into a central data store, but basically can keep it uh, under on your own, right? Um, also, there is no common schema required. So um, in line with the fact that there is no requirement to, to, to have all the data in one data store. A data space does not require that all the data um, matches a certain schema, a syntactic model for how the data is formatted. So basically you can have the data uh, in, in according to your own schema and then it's basically integrated on a semantic level. Um, also, um, that means the data basically um, uh, exists redundantly to a certain extent. So describing real world objects, of course, there are different um, data sets that may describe the same um, physical or real data, uh, real object in the uh, or uh, object in the real world. Also, these data spaces can be nested and can overlap. So, if you are part of one data space, it does not uh, say that you are not allowed to be part of another data space, and these can can overlap. So this is the, the general design principles. And what we um, came off then, um, uh, came up with uh, um, when we started the IDS initiative, so the International Data Spaces uh, Initiative, we added uh, two other design principles, which are circled around or centered around data sovereignty. So the capability of a data provider to control to a certain extent what happens to his or her data uh, once it's gonna, it has been shared and traceability of these data sharing and data exchange transactions, as well as trust among the participants. And that has been touched already by, um, by, by Chris and by Yves Alexandre um, when they refer to authentication and um, making sure that you are really you who are uh, approaching a certain data. So um, how does that look like? Um, you know, the language of the engineer is the drawing. So I don't want to go into all the details, but um, touch about a couple of, let's say, roles that are outlined here. So we have on the left-hand side, the data provider, and on the right-hand side, the data consumer, which is nice. And if you uh, remember the fact that they will basically keep their data on their own, of course, if they wanna share the data, they need to find each other, right? And therefore we need to have a couple of shared service, let's call it in the middle, uh, in particular, a broker service that basically makes sure that data demand and data supply can be matched but also a clearinghouse, um, which locks not the 
content that is shared, but rather the metadata of the transaction to make sure that a transaction has successfully been carried out. And of course, we also um, envisaged um, an app store provider, which is basically um, uh, uh, functioning as a repository for software services and uh, basically software components that can be used as we know it from, let's say, the consumer uh, rearm when we use, for example, the, the Apple App Store. Um, to frame it a little bit more technically, even what you can see here is the software components that are used uh, in order to make this happen, this ecosystem, so to say, of the roles that uh, basically form a data space. And um, I would like to um, draw your attention to a component that we call the connector, which basically um, makes sure that data from a data source can be retrieved, then basically enhanced through certain pieces of metadata, which I will elaborate uh, in detail further on and then exchange the data, the payload data, so the content of the data that's of interest, together with metadata about what is allowed to be done with the data by whom. And on the other side, we also envisage um, another connector, which is a software component that is able to interpret these uh, metadata and also to a certain extent enforce them. So the technology that we are using here is um, mainly um, uh, relating to um, policy enforcement technologies and uh, to be precise uh, in uh, related to a distributed usage control technology. So what does that actually mean? It allows um, business partners um, to share data um, with in, con in addition with um, uh, certain usage constraints that basically determine who is allowed to do what uh, with the data, even if it's shared. Um, and, and these um, usage constraints are depicted here in orange. And you can see here, they, to, from a supply chain context, for example, um, they specify a certain use context. So you are allowed to, um, to use my inventory range or capacity information data for a certain um, um, application, for a certain use context. And you are only allowed to use that data for a certain period of time. And in return, um, the OEM, so the, the automaker, uh, basically shares uh, data with this first tier supplier. Um, again, um, certain inventory ranges, for example, and specifies these pieces of information can be used only in a certain context and also for a certain period of time. So what we did is we came up through, let's say, uh, an extensive longitudinal field study uh, with a well, set of, let's say, how we call it, 14 policy classes. And they specify um, what um, data providers, uh, data holders, allow other parties, trusted parties, to do with their data. For example, the usage is allowed in very general terms, um, but the usage may be restricted for certain purposes. Um, the usage is restricted um, upon the uh, occurrence of a certain event or over a certain time interval. So you can use my credit card information until let's say the last day of the next month and then uh, you're not allowed to do that. You can use my data n times and not more. Um, or for example, um, that you can basically use the data once and then delete it after. So these kind of policies in order not to anticipate that but also um, point to this um, um, aspect right now could form let's say the foundation for how we sometimes frame it of frame it the the terms and conditions for the data economy or at least in data sharing environments so i want to be in control of articulating what others are allowed to do with my data there is one important thing the first thing is that the other party is able to interpret that and not by a human being sitting in front of a computer screen but by a machine so it must be machine readable it must be interpreted in a, let's say, harmonized um, and standardized fashion. And to a certain extent, we also want to have it to be enforceable. So um, therefore, the IDS connector, which I specified earlier on, is also able to enforce these rules and in that case, delete um, the data in that um, software environment when a, uh, a specific um, uh, event has occurred. Um, that has close relations to, let's say, 
the FAIR principles that we know from, let's say, the use of uh, research data and which are very prominently discussed uh, in the current discussions about establishing um, research data infrastructures. And uh, in particular, if we look into the accessibility principle, we can easily um, extend this through usage conditions. So usage control goes beyond access control because it does not only look into is the person uh, allowed um, and authenticated to use uh, to access the data, but it also specifies how to use the data once the data source has been accessed. Um, in general, what we see is that, let's say, this software architecture basically forms the foundation for then emerging data spaces, which are depicted here in blue in the middle. And those two layers then are the prerequisite for the ecosystems that everybody is talking about and where we basically expect uh, innovative uh, services that make our life easier or even uh, allow for new digital business models. Um, I'd like to close with this chart, which basically summarizes on the left-hand side, the business requirements that this data space architecture that we developed in the International Data Spaces Association um, is, uh, is meeting. Um, there are a couple of those that are related to the ecosystem that emerges on the use of this architecture. So it must, for example, be open um, for everybody to join, everybody should be able to take up um, the architecture and the software components that are specified. But um, the provisioning of services um, that are using the specification need to be certified. So I want to trust that they are really not only telling me that they confirm with the rules, but really um, have a certification as a proof point. Um, other requirements are related to, to data rights and data heterogeneity, which I outlined earlier on, and also data flow traceability, because we learned in many cases that um, the reluctance to um, share data can already be relieved once transparency is created about what happens when I have shared my data, because that is often not the case. Sometimes in many uh, occasions right now, I'm asked to share the data and never hear anything what happens later on. So transparency about what's happening and about the data flows is something that is um, uh, deemed very useful. Um, talking about the economical implications from our point of view and also from our work also in the Gaia-X context, um, we see a couple of questions arising that, uh, of course, clearly go beyond pure technical um, aspects. So first is, if I have such a system established, which basically is a decentral one, um, which is not uh, looking into one central data store, um, which forms an infrastructure, how do I fund and finance these kind of things? So is it according to infrastructures that we know from electricity networks, motorways? Um, is it based on usage fees? How does that work? And the other thing is also um, that we um, also, when we look into, let's say, uh, uh, discussions around, let's say, data trustees, and also when we look into the Data Governance Act that was recently published by the European Commission, we see discussions around, okay, we, we need somehow of a cooperative structure um, and a, a cooperative legal form um, to basically um, look in when we talk about the ownership of these data spaces. So is it a public-private partnership? Is it a cooperative society? How should that be materializing? The other thing is then clear incentive systems as we usually have them in, let's say, markets or also on platforms. Um, how do we do that? And also an interesting point also, how do we organize for data governance? Because in the past, data governance has mainly its roots in within internal um, organizations where basically um, instruments of hierarchy can apply, right? You, I have a data standard and everybody is obliged to, um, to, to meet this standard, but this of course uh, cannot be, um, uh, cannot be uh, achieved if we talk about ecosystems where we have, let's say, more freedom, of course, of individual members of this ecosystem to engage or not. So how can you basically ensure that data is used and managed in the desired way? Um, the other thing is, could those architectures be an instrument which, once certified, um, also by default fulfill the requirements of the Data Governance Act, as I mentioned, that is recently um, uh, published? 
And also, could it be a technical means to build federated data trusts in order to also break um, the, the power of control of large platform um, providers on, and hyperscalers? A um, couple of references, and with that, I'd like to close my little uh, talk. Um, thank you for, for listening and hope it was a little bit inspiring for you. Thank you very much, Boris. Uh, there's one question by uh, Paul Seabright, uh, which is, is it possible to verify that uh, data has been del deleted? And actually, I would like to kind of make it a bit more precise. I mean, do you ensure that data is deleted by promising that you're going to be really mean uh, legally to people who don't delete the data? Or is there something uh, which you can do as for an engineering solution. Yeah, or no, is it there something is, in between. There are technical means to allow for technical enforcement of the deletion. Um, of course, all these well technologies are overhead. That is something that we all need to be aware of. So um, what we see is that in, in let's say critical applications um, and um, when very sensitive data is shared, that these kind of technologies are applied. And in other cases, we see companies rely on the fact that they have a proof point um, through the architecture. Okay, my business partner has um, received these um, um, pieces of data together with the usage constraints. So I have a, a proof point. Okay, he should have known what to do with the data or not. And uh, in the case, uh, the business partner misuses the data so basically violating these usage constraints, I at least have a proof point. So there are different levels, so to say, from organizational to technical means to realize and achieve these, um, well, this adherence to the constraints. But to respond to this question, technical means are there and it's possible to enforce that technically. Thank you very much. So our, our last speaker is uh, Ono. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Ono Zeter, who I met when he worked for uh, in Grenoble uh, for the Xerox Research Center, which was something of a mix between academic research and the consulting, uh, internal consulting for Xerox. And now he's gone entirely commercial because he works for a booking and uh, he's going to uh, speak to us about, you know, how do you go about implementing uh, mechanisms in uh, real life, which you know, is, should be dear to the heart of uh, many of us? Uh, oh no. Thank you, Jacques. Let me share my screen. Um, does that come up uh, correct for everyone? It's perfect for me, at least. Perfect. Um, so good morning. Good afternoon and good evening for everyone in the world. Um, I saw in earlier presentations that uh, some of you know Booking.com already. Uh, we're one of the leading uh, online travel platforms. Uh, and the main part of our business is a two-sided marketplace where we help travelers to find places to stay. And so on the buyer side, we refer to customers. On the seller side, we refer to partners. And we are a sizable company. But maybe more important uh, for this audience, for the Digital uh, Economics Conference, uh, we participate in auctions and we run auctions. So on the participating side, uh, the uh, officially announced numbers of uh, 2019, our marketing spend was very close to $5 billion. And the vast majority of that is through auctions. Uh, so that is uh, buying uh, advertisement spaces next to search results, but also places in meta search engines such as TripAdvisor and Trivago. But we also run auctions. So it's not as prominent and, and, and well advertised as in say paid search, but it definitely is an auction. So for every customer uh, coming to our store, there are different options for partners to increase their visibility. For instance, they can give uh, discounts to our loyalty program customers, which we call Genius in return for increased visibility to that, to that group. Uh, or they can, partners can uh, increase their cost of service in return for increased visibility. The details of the programs are maybe not important for this, uh, uh, for this panel presentation, but with this background of such a big company, uh, both participating and running in auctions under the banner of what engineers would 
uh, like economists to know. I think I want to share some, um, uh, say perhaps a request from the trenches uh, of things that you would appreciate when you really try to, to improve, say the systems that bid on these billion dollars or improve the mechanisms that uh, are at the heart of such a big uh, listed company. So when it comes to participating in auctions, and so um, maybe I'm addressing myself uh, mostly to, to those of you that are uh, designing auctions or are consulting for companies that are, are designing auctions. Uh, in the process of, uh, of bidding, as we, as we spend billions of dollars every year, we put in a lot of effort in building models that predict return on <coughs> return that predict return on investment. Um, and what we find is that there are many aspects in con context inputs that we would like to condition on that help in our offline setting, but we can't communicate to the auction. Right, so it might be worth your while to discuss with uh, the advanced bidders in your market to reflect if there are uh, opportunities to, to expand the bidding language, right? Because we find now that we need to approximate certain bids, which of course leads to a reduced efficiency in the, in the market. And the same goes for uh, the type of data that is given back to bidders. So sometimes we see there's a layer of aggregation and that severely hinders us in, um, in bidding accurate models that would be, uh, give accurate return on investment prediction. And again, that would lead to a reduced efficiency in the market. So these are relatively obvious points for those of you that are uh, building, designing auctions or consulting for companies that, that build them. On, on us running auctions, there's, with all things, nothing, nothing is ever perfect. And we would like to always improve whatever we're doing. Same goes for our, our auction uh, format. Uh, but what we find is actually quite difficult to do for such a, for such a big company. It is an oil tanker and it's, it is difficult to, to sometimes make changes, uh, even if we would want them to. And so I want to show two aspects. So again, if we take the engineering hat, if we compare what, would it, what it would take to change a mechanism to say, deciding what new servers to buy. So there's a typical engineering decision. And in some cases, just having this, the specs and the price is enough already to make an informed decision, right? And for, for mechanisms for auction formats, we're quite far off from this. Even though there are very many beautiful theoretical results, very powerful results, they all rely on assumptions that need to hold. Uh, and it is very difficult for us to, to figure out a priori if all the required assumptions do hold. And so in that light, there would be a lot of value for us in more empirical studies maybe even just war stories on the successes and failures uh, of changes in mechanisms in auctions, right? So the, the very fundamental uh, theoretical results are important, uh, but there would be a lot of appreciation for these, these empirical studies as well. Uh, it might be non-trivial to get unbiased uh, reports of this if there is a PR department that can, that can censor things. But if we take a cue from A-B testing, I think the relative openness in big companies about their successes and failures in A-B testing has really helped in democratizing that for smaller companies to, to pick up this, uh, this practice. And it's something where we actively try to, to participate in that, in that literature. Um, and second, and actually last point, I'll try to make it short is the, the end of the conference. Um, is if we compare improving mechanisms versus improving the website, right? So if we were one level up from, say, the infrastructure decisions, as I'm sure you are all aware that most uh, e-commerce platforms are improved using A-B tests or randomized controlled trials, where, say, if you want to compare the version of a red button and a green button for every customer that steps in the digital store, a coin is flipped, and depending on the outcome of that coin flip, the red or the green version is shown. And depending on the metrics that you're interested in, for instance, say clicks, 
then after a sufficient amount of time, you will have the data to determine if the red or the green button leads to more clicks of customers. This gives the opportunity to, to improve using small steps that are typically reversible and therefore very safe uh, and, and therefore test-driven uh, product development. Now, there's a very powerful tool and something what I had not fully appreciated uh, before uh, joining Booking.com is that it also influences culture, right? So they, there is actually in this A-B testing space uh, this slogan of listen to the data, don't listen to the hippo, where the hippo is the highest paid person opinion. And this slogan is, is pushed so much to the fact that, to the point that Microsoft is handing out plushy, uh, squishy hippos as swag at conferences. There's, there's definitely power to this, to this philosophy, to this slogan. The flip side is that it, it makes it hard in that culture to make big, have to champion uh, big untested bets. And large changes in mechanisms would actually fall into that category. So it's something that uh, the whole culture is, is uh, steered away from. Right? And so maybe the main point to, to make is that there are maybe tools lacking or the mature, mature tools lacking. And so one is that if we would have reliable validated testing methods for mechanism changes, that would be very worthwhile. Right, and with validated, I mean, I'm aware that there are more and more papers coming out suggesting ways to experiment with uh, mechanisms. We would also like to have, say, the test of the test. So we want to have the test validated. And with that, I mean, if we consider that we introduce, say, geo-based experiments within the company, then we have the luxury that we can validate that against our A-B tests. So if we ran an A-B test with red and green buttons, we can artificially generate by looking at the sub data. We can recreate an experiment where we give only the green button to London and the red button to Paris, and then compare the outcome of the geo-based experiment to our A-B test, to our more rigorous uh, randomized control trial. And with that, we can get a sense of how accurate, uh, if there, are there any pitfalls that we might not have uh, covered. Um, so that's on, on testing, of course, that would be one aspect of this, say, mirror image of A-B testing for auctions. The other thing would be small steps. So another benefit of this uh, the, uh, experimentation based product development is this the opportunity to make small steps that are relatively safe. Right. And so that could take the shape of a mechanism that has, say, a degree of freedom in it. So we squint our eyes and we look at paid search auctions where there is a quality score. The quality score that it is there and what role it takes in the auction is communicated clearly. What secret ingredients go into the soup that make up the quality scores is maybe not fully disclosed so that over time changes can be made to it, right? That's a very nice property of such a mechanism if at day one you're not 100% sure what this quality should be, right? So one aspect could, could be is to design the auction format for data-driven iterative improvement. The other could be we might have a strong feeling that with a fundamentally different auction format we'd be better off if we can find a trajectory of smaller steps that would take us there, um, then the step of starting that uh, journey is a lot, that barrier is a lot lower than if we would have a full committed bed to farm change in one go, right? And then combined with either of ideally experimentation uh, and failing that uh, with a monitoring uh, would really, um, I think would in all these e-commerce platforms would create a practice where there would be an iterative improvement and testing of these uh, of these mechanisms. So maybe it's a mix of a presentation and say a request. So I speak for ourselves, but I think I speak for many uh, e-commerce platforms that there's a realization that none of these things are ever perfect. And there's a willingness to improve them. Um, but the tools are currently largely lacking. And so we would be very happy consumers
of any theoretical results that you might produce, but also indeed in empirical uh, findings and reports. So with that, um, I hand it back to, to Jacques and we're of course open for questions and suggestions today, or you can contact me via mail.